Folks, as we begin our worship this morning, oops, sorry, messing with my microphone, we're going to take a few moments to quiet our hearts and our minds and to uh, prepare ourselves for worship. Feel free to use the centering prayer in your bulletin. Even in darkness, Christ be my light, or come before God in whatever way works best for you. Let's take a few moments. I'll invite you to rise in body or in spirit, and we can join together this morning in our opening praise. <clears throat> At the beginning of a new day, who will we turn to? Who will we show us the way? God has with us. When the sun's going down, who will we turn to? Who will we show us the way? God has with us. In times when we are struggling, who will we turn to? When we're in conflict and confusion, who will we turn to? Who will show us the way? God and grace and peace. When everything feels out of our control, who will we turn to? Who will show us the way? God, God, today, today, tomorrow, and always. Friends, we are people born of water and spirit. We have made promises to be Christ's faithful disciples and to show God's love to our life's end. And although we often fail to live into those promises, God's promise to us, a promise of faithful love and steadfast grace, endures forever. And so confident in that grace, let us confess our sin and the sin of this world with the prayer that's in your bulletin. Mysterious unity, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are our one and our all. We gather here this day, united in our love for you. We come from different places, with different ideas, different beliefs, different political views, but we are united in our love for you. Help us in this new day, as the world around us continues to clash and to be in conflict and to change. Help us remain united in our common faith and love. Help us accept our differences while maintaining our own integrity, to embrace those differences while still being gentle and kind with those who are hurting today. We are sorry for those times when we forget to be compassionate with people we disagree with. We are sorry for those times when we choose to speak or act in ways that are not loving. Forgive us, loving Creator, Remind us of the bond of unity that we share. Remind us of your call to love our neighbor, no matter who they are or what they believe. Give us grace to meet them where they are and offer our love and support in the midst of this new day. So be it. Let's take a moment for silent reflection and confession. Spirit of your hope and love, God. God, we pray. Amen. Truly, friends, our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. Beloved people of God, believe the good news through the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are indeed forgiven. Alleluia and amen. Friends, I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another. Feel free to move around if that's what you want to do, or to stay put if you are comfortable doing that.
beloved's tree envelope out and say it's not here. that you would weave your words into our ears and our hearts and our minds and our very lives this morning. Help us to take that word out and embody it in all that we do and all that we say. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lie down with me, 
but he left his garment in her hands and ran outside. When she realized that he had left his garment in her hands and ran outside, she summoned the men of her house and said to them, Look, my husband brought us a Hebrew to ridicule us. He came to me to lie down with me, but I screamed. When he heard me raise my voice and scream, he left his garment with me and ran outside. She kept his garment with her until Joseph's master came home, and she told him the same thing. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us to ridicule me came to me, but when I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment with me and ran outside. When Joseph's master heard the thing that his wife told him, this is what your servant did to me, he was incensed. Joseph's master took him and threw him in jail, the place where the king's prisoners were held. While he was in jail, the Lord was with Joseph and remained loyal to him. He caused the jail's commander to think highly of Joseph. The jail's commander put all the prisoners in the jail under Joseph's supervision, and he was the one who determined everything that happened there. The jail's commander paid no attention to anything under Joseph's supervision because the Lord was with him and made everything he did successful. This is the gospel of the Lord. May it be a blessing to our hearts. Mm-hmm. So I recently listen, finished listening to uh, two really incredible books. One right after the other. Is this working? I think my battery might have died. Okay. Just speak extra loud. I will project. Uh, I recently finished listening to two really incredible books that shared a common theme. One of them was a fiction book. Uh, One was nonfiction. The fiction book was a book called Woman 99 by Greer McAllister. And it's the story of Charlotte Smith and her sister Phoebe. Phoebe is admitted to an insane asylum by her parents, uh, and Charlotte decides to basically bluff her way into the asylum to rescue her sister and bring her home again. Now, the nonfiction book was a book called The Woman They Could Not Silence, The Shocking Story of a Woman Who Dared to Fight Back by Kate Moore. And it's the true story of Elizabeth Packard, Elizabeth Packard was committed to an insane asylum by her husband, the Reverend Theophilus Packard, who I hate to say it, was a Presbyterian pastor, for thinking for herself and for disagreeing with him. She is discredited by her husband. She is discredited by her husband's congregation. She is persecuted throughout the whole of her life by the doctor who was the supervisor of the asylum. Nevertheless, Elizabeth Packard spent her whole life fighting for the legal rights of married women and for the rights of those in asylums. Now, both of these books took place around the same time period, late 1800s. Both of them took place in America. The fictional one took place in California. Uh, Elizabeth Packard's story took place in Illinois. And both of them explore two very powerful, very difficult themes. The first is the theme of how easy it was for women in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to be shuttered away from everything that they knew, their friends, their families, their children, all of society, by the men in their lives, by their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, just for disagreeing with them, or for thinking for themselves, or for refusing to tow whatever arbitrary line was drawn in the sand. There's no kind of trial beforehand before these women were committed, at least not uh, before the legal work that Elizabeth Packard did. Um, And they had no hope of release unless those who had put them there in the first place miraculously changed their minds. Now, the other theme that these two books shared was the theme of the rampant abuse and horrific conditions found in these asylums at the time. The physical actions by the staff would certainly fall under the category of torture today. There was forced, unpaid labor. The meals that they were given, if they could be meals at all, called meals at all, were devoid of any kind of nutritional value. There was solitary confinement for the most minor infractions. They were used for medical experimentation. The list goes on and on. 
And as I listened to the accounts of the horrors of the imprisonment in these asylums, both the fictional ones, though they were based in a lot of historical recollections and testimonies of the time, as well as the true story, I couldn't help but think about today's portion of Joseph's story, that idea of false imprisonment. Now let's remind ourselves for a minute the full arc of Joseph's story. Joseph is the second youngest of Jacob's 12 sons. He's the one that has the dreams, and one day when he's kind of a kid, he interprets this dream that he has and basically says to his brothers, hey guys, I had a dream that you were all bowing down to me. And his older brothers, not surprisingly, didn't like that very much. They grew angry, and they uh, decided to get rid of Joseph. So they throw him down into a well, and they're about to kill him. And then these slave traders come by, and they decide that instead of killing Joseph for nothing, they're going to make a little bit of money off him and sell him into slavery. So Joseph ends up in Egypt, first as a servant in Potiphar's house, which is what we read today. Eventually, he ends up in the palace of Pharaoh and soon rises to a place of unprecedented power in the entire land of Egypt. He helps Egypt survive this devastating famine, a famine that is so widespread that eventually Joseph's own brothers who live outside the land of Egypt come to Egypt for food. When they do that, they come to Joseph, but they don't recognize him. Now, through some subterfuge and some cunning maneuvering, the brothers eventually prove to Joseph that they have learned their lesson, that they value their youngest brother, Benjamin, above themselves. And Joseph reveals his identity to them, and the family is restored. Now, like Abram, or Abraham, whose story we read last week, Joseph's story takes up a good chunk of scripture in Genesis. It begins in chapter 37, and continues straight through the end of the book of Genesis, chapter 50. That's a big chunk of text, all for Joseph and his story. Now, unlike Abram and many of the other people who receive God's covenant promises throughout Scripture, there are no instances throughout that huge chunk of Joseph's story where God speaks directly to Joseph. None at all. Not in any moment of his story. There are lots of times that God communicates with Joseph Joseph through his dreams and through the interpretation of those dreams. Some of them are dreams that get him into trouble. Some of them are dreams that get him out of trouble. And many times throughout the text, we're told that God is with Joseph. But not once do we hear God speaking directly to Joseph like God spoke to Noah or to Abram. And yet it's clear that God's presence and God's promise remain with Joseph through it all. This, I think, makes Joseph a more relatable character in Scripture for us, in that grand story of faith. I mean, we get to walk through a lot of Joseph's story with him, the ups as well as the downs. And a lot of those ups and downs are things that we, I think, can relate to. Family dynamics power dynamics in relationships, moments when we feel like the bottom has dropped out of our lives, and times when we feel like we have clawed our way back. And throughout all those times, even if we find ourselves in deepest prayer, like Joseph, I think it's safe to say that most people will go throughout their whole lives without hearing the voice of God. Some do. Most don't. But like Joseph, that doesn't mean that God isn't with us. So let's dig into today's portion of Joseph's story a little bit deeper. There was a great description of this story, kind of a little synopsis uh, that I found in one of my worship planning resources. Uh, Spill the Bean says, this is a humdinger of a story. It is a tale of trust and lust and enticement and exploitation with a lot of integrity and revenge thrown in. It has echoes of a tale as old as time itself, of power being abused for a moment's pleasure, of reputation being besmirched to cover tracks of deceit and lies. And of course, there is the theme of God's favor resting on the one wronged. Now, it's particularly interesting that Joseph is simultaneously in a position of power 
and a position of vulnerability in Potiphar's house. It's a position that Joseph sums up well in his own words from our scripture reading this morning. Joseph refused Potiphar's wife and said to his master's wife, with me here, my master doesn't pay attention to anything in his household. He's put everything he has under my supervision. No one is greater than I am in this household, and he hasn't denied me anything except you, since you are his wife. How could I do this terrible thing and sin against God? Joseph is like Potiphar's second in command. He has power over everything in Potiphar's house. And yet he is still a slave in Potiphar's house. Power and an incredible lack of power at the same time. That Hebrew word that our scripture uses for sin is a particular word for sin that implies forfeiting something or losing something or missing something. And it's also a word that carries these connotations of bearing the blame for something. Joseph is being both very candid and very intentional here. He's making sure that Potiphar's wife understands just how much weight this betrayal would put on his shoulders, on his heart, and on his soul. Yet despite Joseph's reasoning and his wishes, Potiphar's wife uses his power to try to seduce him again and again, and when he refuses, she punishes him. She takes the truth and twists it and manipulates it and plants the blame solely on the victim. And in this part of Joseph's story, I can't help but draw parallels between Joseph and so many others throughout history who have found their lives upended, found them irreversibly changed by those in power. The women whose stories I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon Women in the 1800s and the early 1900s who were falsely imprisoned in insane asylums simply because they didn't fit into society's womanly ideal of the day. Women who were too smart, too outspoken, too independent. Women who fought back against physical and emotional abuse. Women who dared to believe that they deserved the same rights as the men who held such tight-fisted power over them. We can also draw those parallels with all those people whose stories began to surface during the Me Too movement just a few years ago. Stories of people who had the sanctity of their bodies violated and the truth of their experiences questioned because of their gender. Certainly, this applied to scores and scores of women who were victimized by men. It also pertained to men who were victimized by other men, especially when sexual orientation was a factor, but also those who were younger and victimized by older mentors and people in power over them. And just like Joseph, it pertained to men who were victimized by women, less common, no less traumatizing, and significantly less reported because of those ideals that we still hold as a society of what it means to be a man. We can also draw parallels between all those who have been victimized and oppressed and falsely imprisoned and persecuted because of who they are, because of their culture and their race. African slaves stolen from their homes and forced into slavery here in America and across the world. Native American children ripped from their tribes and their families and forced into boarding schools specifically designed and run to obliterate every aspect of their native culture, their language, their dress, their spirituality, their stories, their identity. Japanese people forced into internment camps during World War II just for looking like the enemy. African Americans beat down both emotionally and physically by Jim Crow laws in the mid 20th century. Immigrant children torn from the arms of their families at the border, families that still years later have not been reunited. And anyone and everyone who feels like they can't walk safely down the street as themselves today because of the way they express their gender identity because of the color of their skin, because of the language that they speak, 
because of the headscarf that they wear, because of the gender of the person they love, because of the clothes they wear, because of the prayers they say, because of any other factor that people in power deem inferior. There are so many ways that those in power have tried to subdue those without power. And a lot of those ways, as much as we don't like to admit it, are still happening today, whether we choose to see them or not. Still, Joseph's story is bookended by God's presence. The beginning of our text today said the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and served in his Egyptian master's household. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful. And our story today ended by saying that while he was in jail, the Lord was with Joseph and remained loyal to him. The jail's commander paid no attention to anything under Joseph's supervision because the Lord was with him and made everything he did successful. This bookending drives home the point that God is an undeniable and unchanging player throughout Joseph's story. God isn't just there when Joseph is doing well. God it doesn't just make a fleeting appearance during Joseph's darkest moments. God is a constant, always there with Joseph, no matter what. It's important that we make the distinction that God was with Joseph in those difficult moments, but God didn't cause those difficult moments. They were undeniably terrible things that happened to Joseph, and in the midst of those moments, God was there to hold Joseph up, to care for him and strengthen him, but God didn't make the bad things happen, like some cosmic test to see if Joseph was worthy of God's promise and presence. Joseph's story is a powerful reminder that God's promise is there with us as a constant as well. Rejoicing with us in our best moments, holding us in our darkest moments. God's promise of grace, God's promise of compassion, God's promise of hope, but most of all that promise that God is with us, undeniably, no matter what. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, I'm going to invite you into our time when we got to be the word of God for each other. Our question this morning is actually sort of two questions that are related questions. Uh, how do faith and fairness intersect? And what happens to faith when things are unfair? So I invite you to, uh, you can either turn around and talk to the people around you. You can get up and move and talk to somebody all the way across the sanctuary if you choose to do that. But let us be the word of God for one another this morning.
Um, but it's worth it. It's worth it to have some. You know, just judge because you wore that too. <laughs> Friends, let us come back together from our wonderful conversations. I love hearing where everybody goes with all of these things. So friends, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, our first hymn this morning is number 834, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Thank mm-hmm. you. Merciful God, we lift our hearts and our voices to you this day, giving voice to the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world as best we can, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, that churches of all traditions may discover the unity of Christ and exercise their gifts in service of all. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, that the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and that air, soil, and waters cleansed from poison and dominion based on profit and greed alone. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, that those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in observance and obedience to your commands to love justice, live kindness and walk humbly with you. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, that you will strengthen this nation to pursue just priorities so that all who have been so bitterly divided may be reconciled, the young educated, the old cared for, 
those who are hungry, filled, those who are homeless, housed, and the sick, comforted, and healed. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, that you will preserve all who live and work in this community in peace and safety, especially those who are working so hard on the City Wastewater Project. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, that you will comfort and empower those who feel any difficulty or struggle, those who are living with disabilities, those who are poor, those who are oppressed, those who grieve, those who are in prison, those who find themselves in unsafe and unhealthy circumstances that are out of their control. Lord, hear our prayer. Accept our thanksgiving, God, this day for all faithful servants of Christ now at rest who with us await a new heaven and a new earth, your everlasting kingdom. Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a vessel from humble clay, you form us into a new creation. Shape us day by day through the grace of Christ your Son until we pray as continually as we breathe and all our acts are prayer. We pray all of these things and all of the things that we only give space to in the quietest parts of our hearts. And we pray them in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for it. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is number 773, <clears throat> Heaven Shall Not Wait. Thank you. 
for all of the different ways that our offering comes to us. We want to pray to bless those offerings. So friends, let us pray. Generous God, freely you have given us so many wonderful gifts, and now we freely offer our gifts in return. Our, gift, our gifts presented here symbolize a portion of our gratitude. Please take and use all our offerings, those of our hearts and those of our hands, for the sake of your kingdom today and forevermore. Amen. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning, all. Um, we do have snacks and food, so stick around for some fellowship time. Um, the water in Orinoco, or at least in our part of Orinoco, was shut off on Thursday for most of the day. Um, and our water is still not running 100% clear yet, so we do not have coffee this morning. I know, I'm sorry! <laughs> but we do have juice and other wonderful snacky things. So, stick around. Um, tonight is also our last campfire of the season uh, at 5.30. It's supposed to be really nice tonight, but it's also supposed to be really windy tonight. So if it's super windy, we will have fellowship food inside instead and just pretend that we roasted it over the fire. Because we don't want our fire blowing into places that it's not supposed to be. That's <laughs> not safe. So come at 5.30 and whether we're inside or outside, we'll have the hot dogs and the brats and the, well, if we're inside, I don't know how we'll do some more stuff. We'll figure something out. We can light one of the candles in my office and roast them over the, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But. Bring uh, something to drink, bring some uh, food to share if you want to, and just come and hang out and have some fun. Um, over on the table is our beloved's tree envelope. We're going to replace uh, one of the trees that we took down out front with kind of a memorial tree. So if you want to uh, give any money for the replacement of that, you can put it in that envelope. And there are some note cards sitting next to it, so you can write the name of uh, the person that you are giving that money in memory of. We're going to figure out some way to display those names. Um, so feel free to do that. That'll be out for a while. We don't have a, a determined end date for that. So just that's there. Um, this Wednesday is our Dorothy Day House dinner night. Um, food here by what time? 4.30? 5? 4.30? 4.30. Okay, if you're bringing food, um, you can have it at the church by 4.30, um, or you can go and take it to the Dorothy Day House if you are willing to help out. I think we may need, like, maybe one, excuse me, one more salad or one more dessert. Um, the sign-up sheet is out on the bulletin board. If you can help out, that would be awesome. Um, also on Wednesday, we are doing our weekly prayer service from 5.45 to 6.15, which I know overlaps with Dorothy Day, which is a bummer, but um, we're here every Wednesday from 5.45 to 6.15. Uh, if you are serving at Dorothy Day, we will pray for you while you do that. Um, but just a reminder about that. Also, um, next Sunday is a new month, so we will focus on a different kind of prayer practice next month, which means... Uh, this is our last week of the movement prayer practices. Of course, if you uh, realize you didn't pick it up or if you picked up the stuff for movement prayer and lost it, you can always come to me and I will give you more. Um, but next week there will be different prayer practices and uh, things like that out on the table. So if you want to take some of these and have not taken them yet, um, today is sort of your last day to do that, but not really because I will always give you more. So. Uh, those are out there. Um, also, uh, next, next Sunday is the beginning of October, so we will put out our uh, All Saints Day name banners uh, for people to fill out the names of loved ones that we have lost. We will get those hung up for All Saints Day. Uh, those will be out on the table, and I'll just remind you that if you are writing names, make sure there's something under your tissue paper prayer banner so that we don't leave the names on the tablecloth underneath because that likes to go through. I think those are the only announcements that I know of. Are there any others this morning? Yeah, Jen. Um, next week is also uh, communion, so yes. we will do fellowship next week, but we're also celebrating birthdays. Yes. So if you have a birthday that we don't know of in October, 
Right, yes. So we will do, it's the first Sunday of October, so we'll celebrate communion. We will also celebrate uh, birthdays during our fellowship time and have cake. If you have an October birthday that I don't know about, um, let me know and I'll make sure your name gets on our list. Any other announcements this morning? Friends, I will invite you to rise in body or spirit. Uh, Award-winning American novelist Alice Walker said, No person is your friend who demands your silence or denies your right to, to grow. Uh, I came across this quote this week because it was posted by Black Liturgies, which is an Instagram account that posts a lot of really beautiful, really powerful prayers and, and quotes and reflection questions about race and faith and listening to suppressed voices. And with this quote, they also posted this. You shouldn't have to silence yourself to belong. Who will stay with you once they've heard the truth of you? Who will stay with you once they've heard the truth of you? It's a powerful question in and of itself when you start thinking about the people in your life, friends. But before you leave here today, let me reassure you of this. No matter what, no matter where, no matter how, God will stay with you. God already knows the truth of you. And God stays with you. So friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.